Welcome everyone to our second panel session today. My name is Sarah James and the second panel is going to be about working and living in COVID times. Uh, I'd just like again to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Wurundjeri people, and to acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. So I'll introduce our three fabulous speakers. On the end we've got Kay Cook. Kay is a professor in the Department of Social Sciences at Swinburne and her work explores how new and developing social policies such as welfare to work, child support and childcare policies transform relationships between individuals, families and the state and her work seeks to make the personal impact of these policies explicit in order to provide tangible evidence to policymakers to affect more humanistic reform. So that's Kay. We've also got Julian in the middle here. So Julian Waters Lynch is a lecturer in innovation, entrepreneurship and organisational design in the School of Management at RMIT. His research explores the economic and social effects of emerging technology and how these changes impact entrepreneurship, organisational design and the changing character of work. And Julian's PhD examined these questions through an ethnography of the pioneering co-working communities in Melbourne. And finally, Tanya. So Tanya Lewis is a professor in the School of Media and Communication and the director of the Digital Ethnography Research Centre at RMIT. Her current research is on the future of work and the digitisation of home life. She's conducted a wide range of empirical research, including video ethnographic studies of household recycling, backyard permaculture, and digital ethnographic research on people working from home during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I should say that the images that we're going to be cycling through behind us, some of these are from that study, working from home during the pandemic, and there's also some of your remote work e-change project that the two of you have worked on. So we'll just cycle through, and this will probably bring back some memories of the lockdown experiences. Are we right now? Not all of them good. Not all of them good. <laughs> Okay, so in the first panel this morning, we talked a lot about the different kinds of disruption to people's lives during the lockdowns and the way that this sort of impacted work patterns, the way that it affected different groups in different ways. Um, and I guess in this panel, we're going to be particularly thinking about how this experience was like a huge experiment in terms of how we could um, work and arrange care differently and of course there were some significant challenges for particular groups when it came to this. So I want to start with Kay because you did some research on the challenges faced by single mums during lockdown. So could you tell us a bit about that? So our survey study was a, a more generic survey of people who were eligible for the COVID supplement. So during the pandemic, there was significant changes to welfare regimes where essentially we brought in what we've argued was a mini basic income trial where uh, mutual obligations were suspended for a lot of people and where people received a supplement that equated to about $40 a day extra in their, their payments. And those two things had profound impacts on people. So one of those cohorts was single parents in there that are typically, once your child is school age, you're put on uh, the job seeker payment. You're not regarded as parenting, and so you don't receive a parenting payment, which is outrageous, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> um, so those people had a really positive experience of the pandemic where some of our qualitative data said that they actually had the resources and the time to parent their children during lockdown. So their school aged children who were at home, they now had more money that they could provide better food, they could um, invest in schooling resources. So coloured pencils and like glue sticks and all of those things that they otherwise, they're living well below the poverty line normally. Uh, if they were not employed and or if they were employed in places that were locked down, they didn't have to spend money travelling to their jobs, they might have received the, the payment that people were receiving. There was a great deal more money in those households. So for them, the pandemic was a really good experience for them. And then those benefits 
were tapered off and now we're back to the below poverty line level wages. People are required to go and seek 15 jobs a day, a day, sorry, a fortnight. And so people are back into having to sort of justify their existence, which removes care from the picture and centres them as workers first and any job's a good job, which is at odds with their, like the previous panel talked about, that children still have these ongoing anxieties, uh, facing difficulties to, with the return to school, mm -hmm. and their parents are, are taken out of that situation and told to go back and work first. Yeah. I mean, I think we might come back later because I want to ask you about childcare policies and, and the new Labor government and some yeah. other things. So, so we'll come back, but just to sort of sit for a little bit longer with this experience of lockdown for different groups. So, um, Tanya, your project that you did um, with the households, I think you said it started in 2020, and you were looking at digitally enabled work practices. Um, but you also talk about the work of working from home in terms of all the things that need to be mm. in place to do that. Could, could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, when we initially set up the study, it was a little bit kind of uh, opportunistic. I guess we, it was right at the beginning of lockdown. We were all locked down at home. We weren't able to do um, field work anymore. And so um, a couple of colleagues and I decided, well, let's do some research on what, how people are particularly digitally enabled workers, how they're coping with this, how they're working from home. So we initially kind of recruited, um, or how we were framing the recruitment initially was people who would normally work in the office or go to the some kind of organisational setting on a daily basis, we were interested in looking at people who are now fully at home. So the, the project was primarily based in Victoria, but also in New South Wales. Um, and so we basically followed households for about six months during that really intensive period of lockdown, particularly um, for Victoria. And I think um, the interesting thing about that project, there's many, many interesting things in that project, but um, that while initially we were interested in the kind of media and device aspects of the project, you know, I'm, a, I'm in a digital ethnography research centre, which is in a media and communication school, we actually found ourselves more and more focusing on broader questions about the kind of actual work that people were having to do to set up their homes as, in a sense, organisational spaces. Mm. Um, and it was interesting, you, you know, that, that um, you'd see these missives from people's em employers saying, you know, we, we just want you to, to, to work like you previously worked, you can, you, know, you can do your nine to five, you can, you know, adhere to these kinds of protocols, etc. And of course, as people started to work from home, they realised that that was completely impossible and that their work patterns were changing significantly, but that they also had to develop a whole load of socio-technical and material workarounds for managing work and life at home. So we became increasingly interested in the kind of, I guess, ecologies uh, in which people were working and the, the kind of social uh, and pet relations <laughs> um, in the workplace, but also how people were finding themselves having to ma manage infrastructure, so heating, um, particularly heating rather less than cooling, because of course this was occurring through winter, uh, managing their data and their digital connections, so everyone was suddenly having to become their own IT expert. And so even though this study was primarily um, the we had some low-income households, but it was mostly fairly solidly middle class, as you might imagine, mostly knowledge workers. Um, all of these households struggled, you know, in, in significant kinds of ways. Some, some of those ways were economically because they had to pay a lot more for data, um, and they were having to, they were finding themselves having to um, bring in technicians to do things. Uh, in the house, etc. So I think there are a whole load of discoveries that people were making around the things that they took for granted, I guess, in their workplaces, mm -hmm. which they were now having to organise in their homes. So we're seeing, and I think the useful thing about um, the sort of visual uh, diaries that we got people to, to collect through this process is that we were obviously doing um, uh, semi-structured interviews with them as well, and so they were talking about their beliefs, their experiences, you know, how this was uh, shaping their lives. But they also got, to, they collected visual uh, data for mm -hmm. us and kept work diaries. 
And so we got much more of a sense of that sort of socio-technical and material um, world in which they were operating, and also the way in which their social practices were changing. So, you know, often you'll, you'll be talking to people about what they do at home, around working from home, um, and, and then as they walked us through their desk setup, they'd say, oh, yes, I'm now doing this a lot more, or, uh, oh, yes, I'm having to be my own mail person, I'm having to uh, have an inbox for my mail, and, you know, I go off and post my mail, all these things that used to happen in the workplace. So, you know, doing this kind of um, visual ethnography, I think, is very useful for getting at some of those, those you know, practices. Um, and I think the, the other the other thing here is I, I love the, the image of you know the person working and then every now and again just doing a jazz a jazz tune in the middle you know but this kind of sense in which um, people started to interweave work practices with a whole load of other practices in the home in very complex ways. This, of course, wasn't meaning that they were working less, and I think there was a lot of anxiety in the initial days of the pandemic, particularly from employers, uh, you know, in questions about how do we survey workers, how do we monitor their working hours. But um, certainly in our study, um, people were, work was more intensified, I would say. Mm. It, it didn't necessarily occur across a nine to five um, day in the way that it once did but people talked about um, actually getting a lot more work done than they did mm. in the office space, and this probably rings true for many of you, because of course a lot of the sort of interstitial social aspect of working um, in a workplace wasn't there, so you weren't having the, the kind of water cooler chats, you, you weren't having any of that downtime, mm. so people were just very much focused on work. So in fact, productivity, you know, as a, however we might measure that, probably soared, um, but as, as many of the households pointed to, how sustainable is this? They were all, they, they all um, even though they enjoyed working from home in lots of ways, I think there was a level of exhaustion around that, made, you know, the work of working from home. Mm -hmm. So that was a very long-winded no, response great. to, your, great. to yeah, your question. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, it makes me think, I know, Julian, you, um, you've been looking at these debates from an organisational perspective of you know, how much is a face-to-face -face pressure to come back into the office going to be what we start to see or versus a kind of results-only focused kind of drive? I mean, do you think, and I think you looked at this pre and post-pandemic, mm -hmm. yeah, do you, do you think we're going to see the death of the office? Well, the short answer is no, but no. maybe I'll step into it uh, about how I approached it. So yeah. I was, hi, Jules. Um, I was, you know, prior to, to 2020, I, my research had been on co-working spaces, mm -hmm. but particularly the early phase of them. So I did my PhD on that as an ethnographer, and they were very different 10 years ago than they are today. If you walk into a so-called co-working space, it just looks like a, an office like anything else in many ways. But back then it was developed, co-working was described by those actors as a kind of social movement and it emerged from, now that might be you know, over, over egging it a little bit, but <laughs> it, it emerged amongst people that basically could work anywhere, but often young people, right, freelancers, early stage entrepreneurs if they were thinking about selling business in the 2000s and they, they were working from home but found that inadequate for all these other reasons. So mm. sociologically I found it quite interesting, you know, community at work and mm. if you had have walked into somewhere like Hub Melbourne uh, in 2011, 2012, it looked like you were walking into something that was half a startup and half a kind of hippie commune. There were plants and shy and people sort of having these very passionate conversations in the kitchen about, you know, now that they've left the banking sector, they want to work with people and, and all this sort of stuff. And it was often put forward as a contrast to the sort of suffocating environment of standard work or, and, and management that you'd see represented in Dilbert cartoons and The Office and all this, yeah. right? They're like, we're free, but we want each other somehow. And it was quite uncertain in, in, in a, a sort of project that commercially didn't really work, that model. Yeah. So what co-working did, and I will get to the pandemic, but mm -hmm. it went, you know, the, all this hippie sort of stuff is nice, but the thing that pays the bills is private offices and getting Australia Post into the top floor. And then, yeah. and so a lot of that social connection stuff, uh, they, they couldn't, uh, the way to put it diplomatically and fairly is, the entrepreneurs driving it couldn't really find a business model that sustained that privately. Um, but what it did do, when I was doing that, I had to look at the history of uh, telecommuting, what used to be called that, and uh, working from home, and that goes right back to the 70s, right? In fact, 
the OPEC oil shock was a big um, first drive to say, why are we commuting? Like, well, let's put work into the home. And you found every few years there was always this prediction that just this next technological shift and then everybody's going to be doing it, right? Mm -hmm. So you see this amongst Peter Drucker in the 80s saying, soon, you know, we won't, we, we, we'll, we'll move information to the people rather than people to information. Um, so it was fascinating when we started this project around, um, we were looking particularly at people that moved to the region. So E, e changes, right, mm. instead of C changes or tree changes. So they moved to Castlemaine and um, pursuing the dream, mm. caught a bigger block, you know, working on the computer, but the, the permaculture garden and all that. And then the, and it seemed like a bit of a marginal sort of interest, right? And then the pandemic hit, and this became like suddenly the biggest story mm. that, um, and all these other effects that we hadn't first anticipated examining, like housing prices and rental shortages came up. Um, but to your question about the office, which I completely didn't answer. Cool. I just yeah. to... <laughs> You're kidding yeah. me. The politician thing. Well, I think it's most important. Right? Um, so th th there are these long-standing debates. I link it to productivity, right? So, you know, th th I've been asked so many times, like, are people more productive or less productive working from home? And I don't even think we can give a coherent answer to that in the whole because it's so contingent on individual personality factors, on mm -hmm. what's going on for them in terms of uh, dependence and care, on the nature of the work itself, you know, there's all these, and when you look at the literature on it, you find just a, a, a diverse array of findings, right? Mm -hmm. A very famous study by Nicholas Bloom, economist at Stanford, did like a split test experiment. You hate this one, don't you? But, uh, <laughs> I hate it, it's so interesting. It. But it, it's, it's, it's interesting because it's quite clean. They said they, they randomized, like basically a randomized control trial, right? Uh, Chinese, Chinese firm call center work, so very routinized, you know, very measurable by the hour. Um, randomized, half went home, half stayed in the office. They found the home workers were more productive, largely because of the, the attribution was less interruptions, less now coming to the, the kitchen for someone's birthday. Da, da, da. However, at the end of it, half of them wanted to come back to the office because um, mm -hmm. they were worried about promotion, they were worried about you know, that they lose visibility, etc. But when we think about productivity, I mean, there's how much you get cranking through in an hour, but then there's a larger question about, you know, innovation and the contribution that uh, longer term effects have on productivity. And I would argue, I think many innovation theorists would argue, a lot of that comes from unstructured serendipitous encounters. Mm -hmm. And that's the stuff that falls apart when you fragment everybody into the home. Mm -hmm. So I, what I found is the companies that do this really well, you know, as in they've been doing this for many years. They have a set of social practices around bringing people together at strategic points. Even if the standard is to work from home, they'll do these quarterly big sort of social things for two weeks. And they're trying to build a lot of that almost like mini city dynamic where there's all that serendipitous interaction. Mm -hmm. It's easy to fetishize that, you know, but I, I do think a lot of the um, economic geography literature would emphasize that's a lot of what's happening in cities when diverse people are meeting. and. You know, and, and that, again, it's very hard for organizations to bureaucratically structure that. Mm. Um, so that's my... Mm, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to come back to the eChange and remote work projects, so though. We'll definitely come back to that because that's, that's really interesting. But I just really want to return to Kay for a minute. <laughs> because, I mean, childcare was such a huge issue throughout the pandemic. And it wasn't just that the childcare centres closed for a long time. It was also kind of in the aftermath that we've seen chronic staff shortages in childcare centres and deserts of childcare where you just can't get places. And I'm just wondering, because I know you've been researching in this area for a long time, do you think COVID has actually really highlighted some of these issues in a way that we didn't kind of pay attention to before? And do you think Labor's going to do something about it? And what's your, what's your take on this? Uh, short answer, yes. Good. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> I think the pandemic has been really good for, and it came up in the last panel, it's really exposed all of these existing fractures in society and one, and it coincided with the government who was oblivious to it, was around gender. that, And the the valuation of care work and the care economy and so like single parents suddenly being able to be parents again that reproductive labor was 
inadvertently valued in that scenario, but in our formal care economies, so aged care, child care, education as well, they weren't. They were still stuck in the previous sort of wage system, and that really showed it through in Australia all of our child care policies and so child care was declared an essential service from the beginning of the pandemic so that it could support the economy. Mm -hmm. It was always for the economy. And that really and that's really sort of run through, which has now turned into these discussions about wages and conditions and workforce supply that we're all scratching our heads as to why there aren't more people wanting to be aged care workers and childcare workers when they're some of the lowest paid people in society who tend to be women, who tend to be women of colour, that there's no surprise that these are people who were not on the radar of the previous government. Um, there, so in 2013, we had these same debates. There was the big childcare wage um, campaign called Big Steps, where it was a, a union-led industrial sort of dispute, and it was taken up to government. They, then there was the election, the new. So it was about that these people are undervalued for the the equivalent skills they have, and it it failed in their fair work. Um, the wage, the gender wage comparison case. But then the new government came in and said, instead of these people being overly trained, so you need a qualified teacher in each childcare centre, and people need to have um, a certificate for, they need quite extensive training compared to other industries with that same qualification profile, they're much more poorly paid. New government came in and went, you don't need more pay for your qualifications. What you really need is more short courses and more skills and instead we'll give more money to childcare providers. Mm. It's amazing. Mm. Who would have thought that we could just put more money? And so it's been the marketisation of these things as well that has fed into this because it's about the economy first. Yeah. And that's been the underlying problem that the people who work in these marketised systems who have li very little bargaining power mm. are left behind. Mm. Mm. Are you confident that Labor's going to shake everything up with five billion dollars? I think <laughs> well, I think what the pandemic's been really good at is really bringing these fault lines to the fore and mm. so I think it would be very difficult for the new government to just pretend that never happened. Yeah. And I think the gender reckoning that sort of flowed through the election campaign, mm. I think, will centre these, whether or not the solutions leave behind. So migrant workers were cut out of JobKeeper and childcare centres. Childcare centres were the first to lose the, the JobKeeper eligibility whether the haves within childcare are advantaged and the most marginal within the care workforce, there's still danger that they'll be left behind. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just thinking about the sort of really important gender issues that this has brought to light, I did want to mention that we were going to have um, a researcher who looks at who did a study on unpaid labour in the home during the pandemic and the gender, the way that that's gendered differently. But because we've rescheduled this event three times, they weren't able to make it today. But just to say that, yeah, we, obviously that's a really important part of, of all of this discussion. Um, all right, well let's let's bring it back now to this eChange remote work project that the two of you were part of. So you followed 20 or so households in making this move. What did you find? What are some of the issues and challenges and benefits and drawbacks? Well, to kind of build on that. I'll answer You know, it's funny, I, I, I feel like now is the time to mention it. When I walked in, I, I bumped into Alexia. We hadn't seen each other for 15 years. and. It was like the perfect example of, she could have been in our research cohort. So we followed 21 households. The first thing I'd say we found is um, 
I mean, I should say in terms of privilege and what you've talked about, I mean, these are, anyone that's in this cohort is effectively a knowledge worker. They can work mm -hmm. via their computer. So there's a strong selection bias here around that middle class um, sort of uh, working relations. And, and this, is the working, right? this is the working yeah. from home project, which is a different project. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah that's that has nothing overlap. to do with what I was saying. <laughs> But it doesn't mean their lives, yeah. everything about their lives are easy. I just want to get, state that up front. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, we, the first thing we noticed was quite strong uh, life stage or cohort effects that are different. So and we broke them uh, into three categories. One was sort of younger people tended to be younger um, without dependent children. Uh, that moved often. It was more of a flea change kind of response. You know, if they were living in uh, an apartment or something in Melbourne, it was like, get me out of here. Flea is in Fle fleeing. Yeah, Flee. not, not, okay. not yeah. having fleas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, got it. We, we <laughs> had this joke, you know, and sometimes people would say it was like a flea change or it was an impulse thing we just right. had to get out, you know, or the, the iron, what was it called? The iron curtain or um, oh, yeah. the, the ring of steel, ring of steel. that's steel. right. <laughs> you know, it came up and we were like out of there, right? Um, and then the, the cohort that were generally most happy, at least in our sample, were uh, sort of the young family with dependent children. Um, often they would say something like, we've been thinking about this for a long time, or I grew up in the country, or I had good memories, and during COVID now that our work is remote, we can do it, or we took the plunge or something. Mm. That was kind of mapped to us. And I don't think we found anyone that was unhappy, though, just like bigger house, more room. They're, of course, we're doing this during, largely in Victoria, not exclusively during the lockdown. So of course, I mean, you know, I, I live in o Ocean Grove, I was outside of it, we all felt a bit of survivor bias or guilt rather. <laughs> so people were often very appreciative that they were outside oh, of it. Yeah, yeah. Glad you felt yeah, yeah. guilt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, that's it. And then there was, the third cohort was sort of um, people that brought like the transition to retirement earlier on. Um, mm -hmm. Not necessarily stopped working, but the classic one that stood out is um, they moved from the Dandenongs to Castle Main, five acres, and it was this idea, we were going to do this, but now we can do it now, and we don't have to, um, uh, yeah, I'll pause for a second. So that was, that was kind of step one. What would you say? Uh, well, and just to note, I mean, we, we actually envisaged the project before the pandemic. So we'd, we'd spruced it to ACAN, who is a, like a peak body for consumer technology, um, before the pandemic. And then when the pandemic hit, they were suddenly, that project on re regional <laughs> remote work, that's got to be funded. So um, suddenly, you know, the e-change phenomenon went from this fairly marginal sort of group of lifestyle, you know, driven folk to a much more, um, you know, something that was happening much more across the board. Yeah. And I guess, so we did have this mixture of people who probably were the flea changers, but then we did have, I think a large number of the group were people who'd been thinking about it for a long time. Yeah. And then, of course, the pandemic enabled it in a sense. Yeah. But also we did have people in the study who had done it, who had worry changes prior to the pandemic. And of course, who brought a somewhat different, you know, picture again to the, to the story. So, um, yeah, just to add. Yeah, no, let's say something, I'm trying to think of something more interesting but, but short to, to say. I mean, look, the, the all of the stuff that ha that um, Tanya was talking about in terms of the adaptation to the home, the, 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 um, the pressures around uh, the, the boundary management between work and non-work life, the when you, when you move the spatial separation between work and home, often there's a kind of temporal stretching too. So people might start work earlier, finish earlier, they're doing washing in the day. Like, mm -hmm. there's all of that stuff we could talk about, right? The sort of new work-life practices. Um, and of course, this is a lot of the time with, when schools are closed and they're managing um, childcare or, or homeschooling. But the story that we didn't anticipate and might not have been there well, certainly not as acute prior to the pandemic, was, I mean, most of these people, and this is reflected in uh, wider quantitative studies too, they're not just moving from Melbourne or Sydney, they're often moving from the inner parts of Melbourne and Sydney, yeah. like the classic one. Mm -hmm. And so there's a sort of urban sensibility or like all of the values that go with that, along with the incomes a lot of the time and the sort of knowledge work. These are people that love the idea of the bucolic vision a lot of the time of chickens and goat's cheese and you know all that from the goat or whatever <laughs> you know but they they're inner city knowledge workers right they were and they felt that this prior prior to this was a massive trade-off i mean a lot of these people they're in the kind of electrics electrodes of oak greens but 
they they were often commuting into the city and you know coffee meetings. So there's a big um, there's a really big cultural shift that we started to detect potentially on the social fabric of these regional and remote. And then of course the the dark side of that is really intense displacement of anybody that was vulnerable in terms of housing, anyone in the rental market. These places don't have the same kind of housing diversity that cities have. So like one of the examples that always stood out is someone that got divorced and in Castlemaine. And you know, the cities have a way of accommodating this because you, that there's places, or at least not perfect, but there's a lot more difference. And predominantly there's like four bedroom houses there and now these have, are like over a million bucks. Um, so the ability to kind of manage how does a kid go to school and household separate, like all these things we hadn't necessarily thought about, um, that became as much of the interesting story here. Mm. And of course we're in dialogue with councils, pulling their hair out, trying to work out what can we do about this within our purview and what, what do we do here. So. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> I just I got stuck in your answer and wasn't thinking about what next. Um, well, I mean, I guess just to add to that, so I mean, there, there, there is that, you know, a growing body of work around, I guess, what's, what's termed rural gentrification. Yeah. Yeah. But I think um, it, it'll be interesting to see post-pandemic how this plays out. Because Australia, of course, is a particular example. It's, it's been so expensive for people to, to live in inner cities. Mm. And even though, of course, this is a relatively privileged group, many of them also talked about, you know, the fact that they lived in very tiny yeah. and cramped conditions yeah. in cities, and then suddenly found themselves able to to live you know, these bucolic lives because early on in the pandemic, yeah. there was affordable housing in, in um, small towns of, around Australia. That's rapidly changing, yeah. and as we saw, you know, there the, are the many media reports on this. Um, locals and towns being locked out of their own mm -hmm. town and their own housing market. So I think this is going to be a huge and pressing issue because I, I, my sense is this isn't just a flash in the pan, that people have now had a taste of the fact that they can work remotely, they can actually have much more of a you know, work-life balance uh, in these regional settings. Um, and they're, you know, they're not rushing back to the cities in the way that I think there was, you know, was assumed. Mm. So, uh, but that does have major implications for, for regional areas. There are pluses as well, of course. You know, uh, when I um, talked to people in Castlemaine, for instance, they were talking about the rise of all the arts festivals, and there's been a lot more money put into cultural events, and you know, th those kinds of towns are now trying to refigure themselves as kind of cultural economic hubs. So, and they've, they've, of course, attracted a whole load of employers that they wouldn't previously have, uh, have, have, have attracted. So they've become lifestyle towns, in a sense. Um, so it's a, it's a, you know, a mixed bag, but I think there's some, some really dramatic shifts happening there, um, which, of course, in Australia, where we've been so urbanised, so concentrated uh, in, you know, on the, the coastal urban mm -hmm. Um, areas. So, you know, really this is a very new thing for Australia. Um, so really fascinating times, I think. Just one more small yeah. point yep. there, that hold, but the implication on service workers and lower income workers too is massive here. So a place like Lawn, I think it's like 70% vacant property, so Melbourne is and things. But of course everybody wants a coffee and, you know, and they're just really struggling to get workers here. So, that, I mean, that's that dynamic's interesting how that will play out because there, there, we did detect some tendency, people move there from Melbourne, not Lawn specifically, and then they don't want the place to keep urbanising, right? So then they're, they're petitioning the council, say, well, well now that I'm here, you know, yeah. like I flip my yeah, house from right. Hawthorne to Torquay, and it's much bigger and nicer, I don't want all these incomers, these migrants yeah. coming in. Um, so that will be a tension. I mean, if you drive now from Geelong to Torquay or where I live, it's starting to look like housing state, states almost the whole way. Mm -hmm. um, and this is not necessarily what people thought they yeah. were signing up for. So yeah. that pressure I think we'll see in the next few years. Yeah. Well, <laughs> one thing I was just thinking when you were talking then, Tanya, about the potential sustainability implications of all this, because on the mm -hmm. one hand, less commuting. On the other hand, we're all individually running our heaters in our houses. What do you think? Yeah, it's it's 
it's a really big picture, big question, I think. Because uh, you were researching you know, this before. The well, I was. We yeah, were doing yeah. work on actually. Yeah, we were we were doing a big project at RMIT called the Sustainable Urban Precincts Project, which was really concentrated on the university becoming the sort of big green, mm. you know, branded university. But out of that project, we did a we were doing a more concentrated sociological project with Yolandi Strings, yeah, who's yeah, a sort yeah. of social practice theorist. Uh, on work-life ecologies, so we were doing this pre pre-pandemic, and we were looking at academic work practices, particularly around sustainability. And for us, um, the university just wasn't addressing a whole range of issues around the mobilities of its workforce. You know, it was it would draw this line around the university and say, "We're really green. We're doing all these. You know, we've got solar. We're, we're doing all these amazing things on campus." But then it was encouraging all its staff, of course, through, you know. Uh, conference support mm -hmm. through a whole load of mechanisms within the sort of policy framework, the promotion framework within the university to fly as much as possible. So, you know, universities have these huge kind of um, uh, carbon footprints in terms of, you know, being flying institutions. So we, we were doing work on mm -hmm. academic practices around flying and looking at uh, sustainable alternatives. And of course, remote work was one of those kind mm -hmm. of, you know, big ticket items in that space. Um, and uh, so we got into to work on remote work and of course then the pandemic hit and we started to do this, this other research. But I think at the back of our minds has continually been this question of what are those sustainability implications? The assumption was that um, you know, with people not commuting, with less cars on the road, with people flying a lot less, but we've seen of course a, a massive drop mm -hmm. um, in fossil fuel use. But the question, the big question, is what are the, these practices going to look down, like down the yeah, road, yeah. and that there is, you know, as, as domestic um, sites in a sense become sites for organisational management, that you're also seeing households, their energy um, mm. uh, footprints are going through the ceiling. Mm. Uh, actually, many people talked about their um, heating bills, you know, doubling or tripling, mm. and of course their data usage bills also mm. going up. Mm. I think there's a real there's a real question around um, digital access as a human right, and the fact that uh, even in, you know, these middle class households, um, the working from home project, people talked about really struggling around the cost of data, and when, and those people who are living in more regional areas, having, you know, a, a, a lack of access to decent data. So they'd have two kids at home, you know, homeschooling, they'd be trying to work mm. and they just had to, they just kept having dropouts continually. Mm. So, you know, I think there's this huge inequity around digital access uh, as well. Mm. Um, but going back to that sustainability question, uh, you know, some major, all of those major things that have needed to happen in Australia for a long time, maybe they will happen now. So, mm -hmm. high speed rail I see is on the agenda <laughs> again. <laughs> God will it ever happen. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I think r around organisational practices there has been a shift. And um, again, it'll be interesting to look at that two years down the track. But in, across both projects, um, it seems that organisations are are now realising they can save a huge amount of money by not flying their employees everywhere. Mm -hmm. And they're having a lot more um, online events, online meetings. So I think there, there has been a huge shift in not just university practices, but organisational practices. And the challenge will be really to to translate that into long-term yeah. shifts, yeah. you know, so, yeah. yeah. I'm just looking to see I've got one more question for Kay and then we'll throw it open to questions, I promise. Um, so you started off, Kay, by talking about um, the payments that were made during the pandemic and it essentially being like a basic income payment, which previously seemed almost unthinkable in, in Australia with these attitudes to dole bludging and, you know, the kind of work ethic that we have here. Can you ever imagine something like that happening here? The rhetoric is really strong about individual responsibility yeah. and I don't think the new government has, it hasn't been making any noises maybe as part of a small target strategy but it also has signed up to all of these quite punitive policies particularly against single mothers like mm -hmm. moving them onto parent. Uh, off parenting payments, onto job seeker payments. Um, there's been 
pushes towards like given Anthony Albanese's background mm. that maybe like all of the advantages that he's able to speak about that his mother was afforded mm. are not available to single parents on a disability you wouldn't you'd be lucky to get on a disability support mm. pension at the moment that it's we think that that's what people who have say chronic health issues or are unable to work receive a disability support payment but that's not <coughs> at all the case it's, majority would be on job seeker payments, that that cohort has massively increased and uh, include people who we would not typically think of as looking for work and they're just going through the motions and, and I think that architecture will stay. Mm -hmm. um, the cashless debit card might they're move, uh, talking about whether that will become voluntary on a community basis and then it has great sort of racial overtones that it's mm. predominantly indigenous communities that are cashless debit card trial sites. Um, and Parents Next is another program that this is a voluntary job readiness program for single parents that is, was sort of compelling people, if you didn't take your child to story time at the library, you'd get a breach and your payments could get cut off. And it's, so there is still this sort of moralising of particularly single parents' behaviour around this conflation of sort of good parenting and good, so this responsible job seeker, that that's becoming the same thing. I think this work at home, the intersections between these two areas is that for single parents, it has allowed, and for all parents, it's allowed them to smooth out those previously unspoken, real, the rub between work and care. Yeah. And it's allowed people to smooth that over and make it more livable. And I think what the previous panel was talking about, we're all just a bit worse at our jobs. <laughs> I think that is part of it, that like yesterday I was in, I mean, it was like a quite serious meeting at the university and my kid comes home from school and says, nah! in the background demanding it and that's just accepted now that yeah. we're actually humans yeah. and that's quite nice yeah. to be a human um, again but that does have gendered class yeah. racial that we really need to keep an eye on that because the we're really sort of bifurcating that there's two speeds at the advantages and disadvantages yeah. and so a single parent, there's not a single rental in all of Melbourne that a single parent on the parenting payment or job seeker could afford, mm. like a two bedroom house in all of Melbourne. Mm. So there's enormous challenges as to what happens and so family violence that's ticked along, sort of quite unspoken throughout the pandemic, it occasionally pops up. What happens with that? Where does that go when people can't afford to live anywhere and we're seeing organisational responses around family violence leave, but I think we really need to recenter the structural responses and causes and ensure that they are equitable. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> um, so we'll throw it open to questions now. If you are on Zoom, please type your question in the chat and Matt will read it out. Um, and anyone in the room, just raise your hand for the mic and we'll... We'll bring it on over. Thank, thank you. Um, I, my name's Alexa and I am one of the e-changers. Um, <laughs> but I, I, in my other life too, I, I research uh, relationship breakdown, relationship loss and family violence. I'm really interested in so I can see here in some of the images you're sharing um, how families are kind of negotiating um, the home space in order for it to be both a working space and also a family space. Um, and coming from my academic background, I'm really interested in, interested in any tensions that you saw arise, any sort of relationship breakdown in terms of how the study was shared. You know, you showed an image before about two folders and how everybody's sharing very nicely and equitably, and I'm sure that's not the case in all stories. So I was just wondering if anyone sort of shared stories like that and um, if you collect any data um, relevant to that. Thank you. Yes, the um, good observation that the, the slide with the, the shared folder was in a household where um, the two folk who, who describe themselves as co-workers actually <laughs> in this household, a husband and wife, were youth, they were time sharing, the, they had a little space in, the, in their 
flat, they were time sharing it as an office. So they would put all their individual things into their folders, and then when um, you know Bob would go in there, he'd take out his folder and turn it into Bob's office. And then when when it was Mary's turn, she she get Bob out and she and she put all her stuff out and <laughs> so it was a really interesting way of, of managing um, the kind of boundaries between space and, and between co-workers and you know throughout the study it was, much of it was about how do we manage boundaries particularly in, in these kind of housing environments you know these were folk who were all working at work previously so they hadn't they hadn't set up their homes at all for working from home, so they and they tended to live in places that you know might be open plan or didn't didn't have a home office. So um, a lot of their time was spent spatially reorganising, um, often flexibly. So I think you see in this picture, you know, people using their their lounge room and their dining room spaces as spaces to work in. Um, while people talked about the positives of that, you know, be, being spending a lot more time with family and uh, you know other folk in their in the house and you know bonding with them and with pets, they all talked about having you know if I have to go back to the office, I have to take my pet with me, <laughs> you know that those kind of that affective and emotional dimension of the comfort of working in those environments. People talked about a lot and that they really enjoyed that. They enjoyed being wearing their you know, their tracky dacks and their slippers and so there was a lot of you know this sort of positive affect but also people did talk a lot about the kind of relationship tensions that this produced um, and I think um, and you could think there's a slightly passive aggressive notion there you know Bella is hungry Bella's a dog <laughs> and I think mean, this is a sort of partner going pull your finger out and man you know manage this I'm in a meeting you know it's, it, it's these kinds of so I think those kinds of tensions about when relation when partners do become co-workers and are having to to manage those kind of tensions that that really did um, uh, no one broke up but there were certainly um, you know, quite a few relationships had, had tensions, and, and in one um, uh, one household, they actually used to go and spend time out in the car. Oh. So, um, which was, you know, so clearly those kinds of setups are not sustainable, you know, post-pandemic. Although, remarkably, most people said that they still wanted to have a significant amount of time working from home. So, I think um, people mostly talked about, even though there were lots of you know, it was hard work, et cetera. They, they felt like there were so many benefits um, in terms of, you know, family connection. Of course, these were very middle-class households, so they had a lot, you know, cultural capital, economic capital um, to manage some of these, these issues. But, but um, yeah, so it's a very long-winded answer to your question. There are, like, I haven't done this research, but I'm, I'm sure, correct me if I'm wrong, but I've seen research where men were, if there was a, an office or a spare bedroom, men were much more likely to co-opt that yes. in that sort of right. 1.5 earner model. The, the 0.5 earner was the, oh, well, you, you're on the kitchen table or, which is in our house, like I don't have the office, I've got a little desk, which is why when everyone comes in, like, hello, like everyone's in that meeting, which has now become like the game of how can we get in the meeting. <laughs> but it, it, yeah. it cemented that women's work was secondary work in households. It was very unusual for it to be divvied up on a timeshare with folders, <laughs> I think. Yeah, I think the gendering around this is, is so interesting in the mm. sense that, uh, so you know, I think men, and this is uh, played out in all this, the kind of studies, I guess, that, um, around gender and labour in the home, uh, that during working from home, quite a few men talked about it was so nice being able to spend time with the kids and, you know, and actually I've really enjoyed doing some cooking and, and some laundry, you know. Sorry, I mean, I shouldn't be too trite about this, but I, I think, um, yeah, that, that a lot of that gendered labour that has just been invisible for a long time, that, that it became a generalised experience. And I guess, I guess the question for me is, will that have some policy flow through? Will, you know, will politicians who actually were having to work from home, and, and, a, and a lot of corporate players uh, who were working from home, and, and starting to actually see a lot of that hidden labour that, um, you know, has been invisible. And I guess, I mean, you know, probably I'm being incredibly optimistic around this, but I did feel like um, there was a lot of visibility given to care work, and a lot of journalistic commentary as well, mm -hmm. um, even in, you know, relatively mainstream 
publications. So I felt like there was there's the possibility there of some of some transformation, mm -hmm. but I guess we're all going to have to work bloody hard to to make that happen within the policy space, but particularly given what you were just saying, okay. <laughs> yeah. That, um, that was actually part of my question was about the gendered nature of access to resources within the home, but not just gendered, but also generational. So I just wonder if there was anything coming out of your study that helps us to understand not just that, you know, the women's work is secondary, but is the women's work secondary even to the children's rights to be able to do their schooling? And mm. so how did the gender and generational intersect um, in your study? And you know, what would you like to reflect on in relation to that? I, look, I don't know that we, that we systematically studied those relationships well enough to make those comments. And they were small, qualitative studies. So you know, I think um, it's hard to kind of make broad brushstroke um, comments, I guess, but um, yeah, I mean, anything that comes no, to Nothing from our study. I mean, the thing that comes to mind in the background of this is one of the last uh, major surveys in the US I saw about, admittedly in the US, about preferences to work in the office or work from home are significantly skewed by gender, right? So more women say they prefer to work at home, and the primary attribution is because they can balance care work. And you know some of that could be positive, but the the, the cohort that said they were most w wanted to spend time in the office are younger men, and I think this, you know, in terms of career progression, promotion, the it, it's one thing when everybody's at home, but in these sort of hybrid circumstances, in many ways it's more complex because presumably there's conversations and you know going out for drinks and all of that stuff. If that becomes m more a, a much more gendered, polarized place, that has big implications. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks. I was just thinking um, of a question for Kay, but I was actually still wanting to ask something to Julian also and Tanya. Um, and that is whether you had any evidence that organizations, so employers, actually responded to you know, that shift of um, responsibility to take care of everything to their workers, um, whether yeah, employers are actually starting to respond to that by um, accommodating not just flexibility but also something else about this home working and I'm mm -hmm. asking that also because recently in our household we received or rather my partner received a parcel with a pot plant um, for his friend <laughs> and he's afraid of working in the corporate sector oh. but obviously some, someone told them that uh, plants enhance creativity and <laughs> so, yeah and I haven't received anything like that from the trope uh, he also received um, um, uber vouchers for nice meals so yeah just wonder whether there's a trend or also in, in employers responding to that, uh, accommodating yeah, um, yeah. the shift to the Instagram. I, I, but the hard thing is I blend the two projects now. It's quite difficult to, to pull them apart, but certainly there were examples, I think, across the, the projects of, of employed or organisations starting to recognise, you know, the, just this huge amount of labour that people are having to do in the work in the home to turn it into a workplace. So. Uh, not all institutions, of course, but um, but certainly some organisations, and so some of that, you know, token gifts, mm -hmm. um, also um, some subsidies for for um, uh, developing more ergonomic setups at home. So quite a few organisations have been doing that, and also data subsidi subsidies for digital. So you know, I, I imagine that we're we're going to see the policy space shifting around this in terms of the need to regulate some of this so that organisations actually um, support remote workers around a whole range of areas. And I mean, I guess the good thing about that again is that it makes visible certain aspects of you know, the gendered and, and otherwise labour of what's going on mm. in the home. Um, and I think it has real implications for sociology as well for, you know, we, we've tended to relegate um, studies of the domestic and the family to these to the sidelines. And you know, one thing about working from home and its and its generalisation during the pandemic is that the home is now this, you know, the so the central kind of social and economic hub. Um, it has become that, and I think, in many ways, it's it will continue to be to I think have a play a strong role as a kind of um, some sort of hybrid, I guess, between a workspace and a and a home space. So I think. You know, that has huge implications for, for sociology and sociological theories and categories, but also I think for the sort of ethics and politics of, of 
um, you know, the normative questions of sociology, you know, how we define the important kinds of questions around, um, you know, when we study work, we tend to focus on organisations. You look at all the journals, um, it's, it's all very much focused on, on really quite old-fashioned constructions of, of, of work and where work occurs. So I think we're going to, we're going to see some big shifts in, in those spaces over the next few years. So that went from a pot plant to, to journal changes. <laughs> um, just a, a quick question uh, online. Actually, a comment first from Rosie saying, uh, I didn't clean for six months because my male partner was home with nothing to do. It was the best. Uh, I don't know how common that was, but that was. That was. Um, and uh, Ramon has a question uh, for Tanya and Julian. Uh, and he's asking, what are the consequences of e-change for the social fabric in the regions? Is e-change fostering what Robert Bella called lifestyle communities? How can people that have been displaced from towns articulate their social demands in terms of housing needs or quality of work now? How can they advocate against these pressures, I guess? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hello, Ramon. <laughs> yeah, that's a big question. We can probably both, both speak. I don't know about the advocacy point of view. I mean, th there's a way, wh what I've been trying to say to councils is, like, uh, 30,000 knowledge workers sitting in their home five days a week, isolated, isn't sure they're spending in the local community, but uh, there's, th there'd be a massive lost opportunity there in terms of uh, the way we think of social capital and also my interest in innovation often comes from those interactions. So I think that the, the forums through the, these class of e-changes actually working, contributing to the local community is a little, um, is still a bit uncertain. You know, for, for a lot of the last two years there was, a, there was a, a health reason to try and stay home and not congregate. Um, you know, my, my background interest was in co-working spaces and some of the, one would think one potential solution to this issue around um, the challenges of turning the home into a site of kind of contested productivity and shared is, uh, is to have a, a, a workspace locally that people can go to, um, potentially from different organisations and meet each other. But the appetite, and it goes a little bit back to your question too, at the moment for an employee, asking them to pay for that is probably not going to be economically viable. Uh, a lot of the uh, flexible workspace providers would say, I mean, they tend to set up in the cities. There's not really a model in smaller places that is economically viable. But the, the vision of, I always come back to thinking about libraries in the 21st century, and we have sort of public infrastructure there that's paid for with a very, in many ways, 20th century model of access to information, which is you rent a book, and it's, I love them, you know, I have a kid, and we go and rent a book. but. The reality is it's, I mean, that was essential post-war for literacy and these things. My sense is that there's actually a space somewhere between the school, the municipal library, and that kind of regional work hub um, that could have quite a positive impact on the social fabric. Not, not so much for the, um, the most vulnerable people, they're kind of separately, but in terms of creating uh, kind of communal life or, or social life there amongst these workers, that could be positive. Yeah, and to, to add to that, I mean, I think across the board with the e-changes, they all, you know, I mean, one could say this is somewhat romanticised, although, as, as Julian was saying, a, a significant number of people had, had country backgrounds or rural backgrounds or had spent some time as a child in rural areas, but they all talked about wanting community, mm. wanting connection. Um, uh, ironically, of course, during the pandemic, that was much harder. But, um, but, but you know, I think for, for many of them, there, there was this real desire to um, move away from, and they often talked in these, in these quite stark terms of the alienations of the city, of, you know, of, of the sped up city life where they were just feeling um, very disconnected. Uh, and so, you know, this was, for, for many of them, work was really not the issue. It was about wanting to have a life change. And yes, they were lucky enough to have jobs where, that they could, they could mm. continue to have in a regional area, and of course, with salary attached, so they had urban salaries in regional areas, which goes a long way. Um, and I, but I think for, for a lot of the, those families, they were really aware of the kind of class 
issues around this of, of the fact that they are, they are urban cosmopolitans. What does this mean when you move to a to a small town with an agricultural background or that's largely service um, economy? Uh, you know, so there, there was reflexivity around that. Um, and quite a few people talked about joining community groups, trying to get engaged locally. Um, but um, but I, you know, I think, of course, you do see a kind of a little bit of a siloing effect, a kind of um, a tendency for those folk to, to gather with other bourgeois. When one was talking about these lifestyle enclaves um, forming in these kinds of places, and I guess one of the things that we talked to council about was, you know, how do how do you how might you mitigate against that in, in, in terms of your kind of planning? Mm -hmm. um, so. You know, we had pretty robust discussions with them, and they have concerns. I think you know very strong concerns around um, what do these big shifts, migration shifts, mean for the future of their of their towns in terms of diversity. You know? One so, tiny tiny point: some of the people in our cohort expressed the idea that they wanted to work more locally in the community. They were actually they wanted yep. a kind of career transition, so rather than this attachment to the city. Mm -hmm. I was just going to add, sorry, from my own lived experience going out to one of, I live in Wangaratta now, I moved out from Melbourne, that um, one of the other mums I met through Playgroup was actually a medical transcriptionist and I had some additional transcription work that I couldn't get to and I actually said to her, do you want to do this work? So she got paid more than she ever would for a medical transcription to do this work. It expanded her skills in terms of doing transcription. She now wants to do more academic work. So there can be these flow and effects that you don't kind of expect or predict where we're kind of bringing urban work out to the regional rural areas. No one would have ever met her or contacted her if it wasn't for me moving into the area. We're really good friends now. And she helps me in terms of like knowing places to go, you know, places I can take my kids out in bush and stuff like that. So we have this like wonderful knowledge exchange between a local and a newcomer, and she's one of my closest friends. So I think there can be ripple effects, and councils could probably help facilitate some of that for people coming in, connecting us with people who've lived there a long time for us to start sharing some of these resources. Well, we're going to have to finish there because we're past the hour. So please join me in thanking Kay, Julian and Tanya for a really great discussion.